economic space. Mark Bailey from Fig Securities joins us now. Mark, hello to you. A very happy Monday. Um, in terms of the U.S., we did see um, really a, a mixed bag of, of items coming through, not only uh, the economic data ec coming through a little bit weaker than we perhaps would have liked or indeed have grown accustomed to um, of late, but also um, Fisher's comments on fiscal policy. Yeah, good morning, Natalie. I mean, just covering off on the data first, as you rightly point out, that uh, uh, University of Michi Michigan consumer sentiment came in uh, below expectations, although import, import prices at 0.4% were slightly higher than consensus. So, uh, as you say, kind of that mixed bag continues. Interestingly, as you, as you rightly point out as well, you know, Stanley Fisher, who's the Fed vice chairman, um, had some interesting comments on the fiscal stimulus and said, look, there's still significant uncertainty surrounding, you know, that side of, uh, you know, Trump's policies and, uh, you know, we'll probably get a bit of clarity maybe at the State of Union address uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Interestingly as well, I know you talked about in your lead-up, um, you know, one of the, the U.S. Fed's top regulators has resigned and um, Stanley Fisher also had some comments on the Dodd-Frank Act as well, saying that it's very unlikely that will be fully repealed, uh, although there will be some changes uh, around the edges. And I think that's really key as well because, you know, what the regulations have done, both Dodd Frank and also BAL 3, and what BAL 4 will do, is they've made um, the banking system significantly more um, sustainable and safer. You know, capital levels have been increased. You know, banks have got a lot more um, sustainability in terms of their capital levels and also the uh, uh, instruments that can be bailed in and so therefore it's less likely to fall back onto taxpayers and governments for, for bailouts in the future. So it'd be, it would be actually fairly negative from a bondholder's point of view if that was significantly changed with a, a, a major change to the Dodd-Frank Act. Obviously very positive for equities because you know, they'd, uh, the banks would be allowed to you know, move into those areas that they have retreated from because they haven't been uh, you know, uh, kind of efficient in terms of use of capital. But I think in terms from a credit point of view we'll be watching that closely because any kind of uh, softening of that regulation will actually make banks riskier and potentially make it a less uh, safe place and less positive investment from, from the credit side of things. And indeed, um, Fed Fisher coming through not only in terms of uh, the Dog Frank rules, but also, and we just had this up on screen, um, pertaining to the, the uncertainty uh, that is, is currently existing, saying there is quite significant uncertainty about what's actually going to happen, saying, I don't think anyone quite knows. Also reinforcing that the Fed will focus on getting inflation to 2% and maintaining uh, full employment. So really continuing to, to reassert, I guess, where the Fed's focus currently Currently lays, but naturally, this coming ahead of um, the as you um, flagged, we've got U.S. inflation this week. We've also got um, Yellen's two-day testimonies coming up in the week ahead as well. So, very interesting week ahead for for the U.S. outlook. I, I think that's right, and I think probably the the key point of those those three. Um uh, data plots is probably the inflation on Wednesday night our time. I think that's going to be the key one and if you start to see some core inflation coming through then obviously that's going to tilt the, the Fed hand a bit firmer but I would fully expect that Yellen would probably continue down that hawkish slant that she has maintained in the last 18 months positioning that market for uh, future hikes um, you know, and then potentially when we get there at the moment, March, uh, March is around about 30% um, chance of a hike. You know, if we get a high print on the inflation, maybe that moves up to 50%. But I think Janet Yellen in both the testimony uh, in, in front of the House, uh, Senate and the, and the banking subcommittee as well, will will continue to position the markets for that hike. You know, I don't think we're going to get three this year as I initially thought, but, you know, maybe one or two down the line. But, you know, it's, it's the best way to position the market because then the, they, they won't get spooked uh, as and when that happens. And she's continually played that role uh, consistently over the last uh, 18 months. And I think that's the right way to do that. Uh, and I would expect uh, more of the same this week. We're also watching, uh, we saw the FTSE 100 uh, pushing higher in Friday's session off the back of what was really a, a triple threat almost of positive data coming out of the UK. Um, it, it has been commented that the UK continues to um, surprise really in its resilience um, off the back of that Brexit vote. Um, but I would just put to you, Mark, that the UK hasn't actually left the European Union yet. There has been no move. So why is such resilience a surprise? 
Um, I mean, going back to the data points again, you know, you had, on Friday you had incredibly strong industrial production and manufacturing production figures that can, you know, smash the consensus uh, estimates out, out of the water. Um, in terms of, you know, why you're seeing that, obviously it's been helped by the significant devaluation of sterling, and that's helping, you know, our exporters um, and, and uh, producers, you know, export goods on a more, you know, cost-efficient basis, and also making it more expensive for importers to import goods domestically. So, you know, you, you naturally would expect to see a big boost um, from those exporting companies uh, from the devaluation of sterling. So it hasn't been that much of a, uh, a surprise, but again, it, it does seem to be performing significantly better than, than consensus. And whether that can continue, you know, potentially as we do move down that path, you know, Article 50 still uh, is scheduled to be triggered by the end of March by uh, Theresa May, uh, the UK Prime Minister. Once that happens, then that uncertainty probably does increase even further, and you may start to see you know, more and more companies pulling out of the UK because it's not going to get the benefits of the UK base exporting into, into Europe at, um, you know, with, the, with the trade um, regulations as are at the moment. And you've, you've seen that you know, specifically in the banking sector, which, you know, probably has some of the highest uh, capital mobility and, and uh, labour mobility in the different various sectors in the UK. You've seen banks looking at Dublin as an option. Um, you know, again, a couple of weeks ago, some US banks again were saying, look, that's where they would move uh, their European head offices if um, the UK was not able to negotiate some favourable trade uh, negotiations on the on the finance side and get some passporting for the uh, their, their banks, their investment banks in London. Uh, alternatively, you'd see people maybe moving off to Frankfurt and Paris as uh, as other options back to continental Europe as well. So. Yeah, yes, we have had very strong figures and they have surprised a lot of people, a lot of economists and probably the Bank of England as well in terms of the resilience of the UK economy. But I still think that down the line you're going to start to see the real impacts of firms not investing capital in the UK, moving their production, moving their headquarters uh, away from London and away from the UK uh, into uh, other parts of Europe to continue to benefit from uh, the trade um, nego um, trade regulations that they have with uh, with the European Union. Indeed, when it comes to Brexit, European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker saying, uh, I doubt the bloc's remaining 27 members can maintain unity after Britain leaves. Britain cannot negotiate trade deals as long as it is a member of the EU. But Brexit wasn't the only topic that Juncker was commenting on over the weekend. Uh, also, when it comes to Greece's bailout deal, saying that, yes, it is on a shaky ground in the sense that we don't see how the IMF could manage this problem. We'd just love to get your take on this emerging sort of reissue of Greece. Yeah, Natalie, it continues to, to, to roll on. You know, every, every, every time we think we have a solution, there's, there's no solution um, that actually gets, gets proposed and, and, uh, and then actually acted on. At the end of the day, Greece has got too much debt. Its debt load is unsustainable, and some of that debt needs to be written off. The IMF is is keen and is continually pushed for that over the last six months to a year. However, the European Union and especially Germany is saying, "Look, you're not allowed to do that." And part of the reason is because a big holder of Greek government bonds is the European Central Bank. So that would be a write down, which would have to be funded by you know the uh, the other members of the European Union largely Germany. So there's this standoff and again you had the negotiations on Friday where there wasn't expected to be a positive outcome and there certainly was in terms of the talks. The EU finance ministers are meeting uh, a week today um, on the 20th of February in Brussels to again discuss Greece and what to do um, because it's got a, it's got they've got to agree before they can release the next tranche of the the bailout package. Greece is around about 23, 23 billion euros of principal repayment due between now and the end of August with around about uh, seven, eight billion due in July alone. So it's critical that they do come up with some kind of solution. But again, you know, there does seem to be a standoff, which it seems to be, you know, pretty uh, ir um, unsolvable from the IMF and the EU in terms of what you're actually seeing in terms of how they're positioning it. So, you know, it, 
the debt needs to be written down, but the EU is saying, look, we, you know, Greece needs to cut um, you know, its budget surplus even more, uh, and you know, it's, it's just not possible. I mean, Greece has gone through huge austerity measures, a huge austerity programme. You know, I think, yes, they do have to collect more taxes. They do have to you know, concede some of the pensions are very, very attractive uh, by e European Union standards. But they have uh, kind of initiated and progressed fairly well with a lot of radical reforms. And at some stage, you know, you're going to have to take a haircut on the debt, which is an actual write down rather than just pushing the maturities and uh, lowering the coupon payments of that debt further into the future, because that's not a, a long term solution. And I'll be talking to you on this topic in a year, two years time, unless there's actually some uh, some haircuts on on the debt. Absolutely. It does appear to be Groundhog Day somewhat when it does to come to that Greece bailout story and certainly something that I believe will be on uh, investors' radars for the weeks to come. Mark, we will have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Natalie. Have a good day.